Hi, welcome to Studio Sunday. Uh, Robin is away today, so I'm doing the show uh, solo. Wish me luck. <laughs> um, I spent the week putting together the new Complete Paradise 2. You know, I put out a collection of my cartoons and strips from my early days. Um, I put that out a number of years ago, and we wanted to make a new version that includes a lot of my cartooning since this time. Um, the thing that's cool about this book, uh, the reason why it's worth reprinting, is because so much of my comic book work was the ideas came from here. Um, and it, it, I, I know that in my mind, but going through the strips on my table and seeing them, uh, it, it just, it still blows my mind. Uh, you know, I'll think like a book like Echo, uh, my sci-fi story that, oh yeah, I just sat down and got inspiration and started doing the book. No. <laughs> Turns out, um, I can see where the idea for the plot to Echo happened all the way back in an early comic strip where um, the military loses a nuclear bomb and my character uh, <laughs> is the one who finds it. Um, and this character is a complete, uh, you know, he's an idiot. Um, so now we have an idiot who's sitting on top of a nuclear bomb. This comic strip was done years and years before the story of Echo was ever written. And of course, I modified it and changed it from a cartoon before buffoon to a uh, just a, a regular person. Uh, the story of Echo was all about what if one of these WMDs fell into the hands of just a regular person who's even struggling to pay their monthly bills. Um, it is is an, a regular person, an average person. Um, can we trust that person more than a hostile government with a WMD? Um, and I kind of that's the subplot to echo there are a lot of action on top but that's the point of it you know it's like uh, uh, i would rather if i knew that there was one M wmd in the world just one um i have several friends that i would i would trust to have that and i know that they would not unleash it on the world <laughs> so i was trying to make that story but anyway it started with a stupid comic strip um and also in the strangers in paradise books uh, Francini Cachu, when you start reading the series up there, a big long series, we launch into the series and these characters are fully developed. How is that possible? Because I had been cartooning them for years in comic strips. And it could, this is like one of the earliest ones I could find. And the hair color is flipped. Um, and so I have my Cachu prototype with dark hair and she's Madison. And then the Francine prototype is the sweetheart, the sweethearted uh, friend, and um, then the tough friend. And I just love the combination because you have one person who's naive and sweet, and the other person is acerbic and uh, cynical, and, and but has a really cute way about him. Um, I, then later on, that developed. Francine began to develop into more of what you look. She looks like in the comic book. Um, so I'm pulling from the drawing table here. Take a look at this. That's stacked according to like um, Francine and Kachu prototype strips, Francine strips. Um, these are all the Kixie strips. Those are the earliest comic strips I ever did in the formal comic strip way. Um, there's still stuff in there. A lot of miscellaneous, the Hollywood, all the David strips. David first showed up as a character in a, a strip about the Hollywood um, life, um, the people that work in the industry. Um, and then over here in the corner, I have, you know, my little polar bear who I just started, I drew one time in a sketch and just thought that's so charming. I think the first drawing I ever did that I loved, it's right here. I drew, I was doodling and then I put this caption on it and I immediately fell in love with this poor guy. Life without chocolate. <laughs> so uh, that's that's what's going on there. And then I have a ton of other comic art 
and cartoons in here. If you take a look, um, a lot of Kixie prototypes right there. Power Girl. Uh, just tons of stuff here. And then all the stuff back in here. And um, things that weren't in that original book are going to be in the new one, like Bick and Beep, who I absolutely adore. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen these strips. I posted them somewhere a long time ago. Um, and I also got special permission to reprint my three-page series of strips about Charlie Brown and Lucy. Um, this is a tribute to the master, and uh, a lot of people contributed these guys. Uh, and I was lucky to be in there, and I got permission to put it in the book. So that's what the new book is all about. It's There's so much more material than just this from 2010. Um, and I think uh, now that I've done some, you know, some more books, um, I can really see all of their birth in these old strips. So clearly I am somebody that has these, these ideas and then I develop them over time. Um, so if you ask me the question of where do you get the idea for your characters, I get the idea for uh, one character in general and then I'll just keep drawing and writing little sequences until I, that character becomes more fully formed. Next thing you know, they've got a book. Um, so I have a question here that is, that is very apropos of what I'm talking about. I mean, I hate to use a, a college word, but yeah, this fits right in with what we're talking about. There, there's the street language. <laughs> um, Hugh Timms is asking me the question about writing. Um, saying, Terry, how do you balance writing and drawing? Do you begin working with any editors besides friends and family? I am stagnant in the, we in the weeds on my script writing and I don't want to draw my books without knowing and having an ending that I believe in. I had an ongoing that suddenly had too many characters to plot def definitively and I just got worried about losing my audience. They're worried about creating a web shop because I'd have to pay taxes on merch. Um, any advice is greatly appreciated. Okay, um, balancing writing and drawing. Um, I draw for fun. I write because I'm dying to read the story. Um, that's basically my dynamic. Um, I write the story because I want to read it. I was dying to read the story of Francine Cachou and I could not find it anywhere. Most of the stories that feature two women uh, doing a tug of war with their relationship had a different dynamic to it or a different point of view. And I wanted something um, that was more like this, where I had these characters that I was formulating in, in my strips. And, but the tug of war was over different problems than you might find between just the normal, um, uh, couple who are out of sync. You know what I mean? I had a different way of them being out of sync, and that's what I wanted to write about. Um, so that's about what most relationship stories are about. Um, fortunately, I'd been cartooning all that time, and when it was time to draw the story of Strangers in Paradise, I, I knew how to draw it. And even though I say that, in the first year of 1993, the first issue looks very much like my strips. Within three years, I had morphed into more of a comic book style because I was surrounded by all these great uh, comic book artists back in the 90s. Uh, think about Wildstorm launching, Homage Comics, um, Image. Um, it was just a real renaissance of great comic art all the way around me. So I was going to shows and I was seeing all these people and they inspired me and they brought my game up from you know, newspaper strip cartoonist to comic book artist. So the crowd I was hanging out with brought me up. I incorporated their, what I saw from them into my work and tried to keep my own style. Um, seeing great artists a, at San Diego and looking at their work, I realized that my old, my old style of newspaper drawing uh, with mismatched this and that and all these open lines and everything, um, it, 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 it changed me. <laughs> um, 
So Hugh is saying that he's in the weeds on the script writing. And don't want to, you don't want to draw the book without knowing what the ending that, that you believe in. Um, I The only thing I knew about Strangers in Paradise when I started it was that I would take two characters that were at opposite poles, and then I would have them meet at some point in the middle of the series where they're there, and then they end up on the other side, each side. So what I mean by that is that by knowing each other, Francine's big heart, that sweet woman who um, is experiencing life in her way, is able to have an influence on this totally bitter, abused, uh, but so clever and funny and witty and worth worth knowing, Kachu. So the big heart is, is healing the damaged heart. And by the time we got to the end of the series, Francine had totally lost her naivete. And it was because of her experiences with her uh, acerbic friend and her love of her, that became the love of her life, Kachu. Kachu was able to take the naivete off Francine and she became a very strong, full rounded woman. And then Kachu, by knowing Francine, uh, began to see the other side of life, the side where people love you and adore you and treat you well. Um, she needed that, and Francine gave, her the, gave that to her. Um, you would think David did it, but all David could do was love her uh, from arm's length in, 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 in a way. Um, the connection, the real soulful connection was with Francine, and it healed um, her heart. Um, so that's how these two care. That's all I knew. Now, the journey, how they get there, that's what um, I used my instincts to take me in um, uh, on the, up from chapter to chapter. So there's a hundred and, what is it? 109 issues of Strangers in Paradise. So that's 109 chapters that I wrote in this book. <laughs> and I didn't, when I was on chapter 10, I had no idea what chapter 20 was. I just knew that I was going to organically work my way there. Because I was doing a comic book series, I knew that I had the luxury of time. I thought I was going to do Strangers in Paradise for the rest of my life. I thought that was my ride. That's my Superman. That's my Spider-Man. Um, unfortunately, the market didn't work out for me, me that way. My sales uh, grew, got so low by the end of the series um, that I had to stop. And so it was economics that, that stopped Strangers in Paradise. What's that, Robert Frost? <laughs> gold, everything gold cannot stay. Um, so um, that that's what happened to the story. And when I realized that I was, I had about a year and a half warning or two years warning as I watched my numbers go down in the book and I knew that, okay, let's get serious now. And unfortunately I had told enough story that I was able to, I had everything in, in place. All my all my pieces were right here and, and it was time to now pay what I called pay the check, write the check and pay off the check. You made all these promises in the story along the way, um, and now it's time to prove it and pay it, pay the, the check for the stuff you wrote. For instance, one of the, when I say that, one of the things I mean, like for instance, I spent probably the first one third of the series saying, oh, could you had this wicked past? Oh, it was bad, oh, it was bad. But I was leaving that to your imagination. And maybe you think, of Wicked is like this, and I was thinking Wicked is like that. So at some point in the series, we begin showing you exactly what Darcy Parker was like and Parker Girls and what they did and how violent it was and how seedy and just, oh my God. So it was time to show that. Um, if I had never shown it, it would have always been, oh, she's a bad girl. And you think, oh, what? She got... Uh, grounded from school or something, you know, you're thinking this, I was thinking that. So, um, yeah, that's that's how I worked my way through the story. And when I knew that it was time to wrap it up, everything was in place and I wrapped it up. And um, I got to tell you, um, that last one third of the series when I it was time to bring all that stuff together and merge, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. It's fun setting up all this stuff, and then in the middle, your character is coping with the consequences of all the setups, 
And then it's time to have everybody merge into one room, just like a murder mystery. And uh, all the plots come together and beat the hell out of each other. And golly, that's fun. <laughs> so it's worth it. Um, you had too many characters to plot definitively and got worried that you're losing your audience. That is a good point. Um, if you have one of the things, one of the earliest pieces of advice that I got from a cartoon editor was you have too many characters uh, in the strips you've sent us. Uh, just focus on uh, two or three, make them really strong, and then the, uh, everybody else can come and go. Characters come and go, but you have your focus. So if, if we talk about Peanuts, you know who the three or four main characters are. Everybody else is, is supporting cast. Um, that's how you want to do it in your story. Um, even if you wrote the biography of Napoleon, um, there's really only one central character. There's a thousand supporting cast characters like everybody else on the planet. But you know who the story's about. Um, James Bond, you have James, you have the villain, and you have a girl. Um, there's three characters in that story. Everything else comes and goes. Um, so think of it that way. Um, usually what I have found, the way that may help you just figure out the, to see this in a new way, is that sometimes what you're doing is you're distributing every idea you have amongst different characters. Uh, oh, I'm going to have that character play guitar. I'm going to have that character uh, likes Porsches. I'm going to have this character over here is, uh, is is a writer who travels too much, blah, blah, blah. Why do you have three characters for that? One person can do all that in your story. And the character becomes more interesting. Instead of like, oh, he's the guy who lives on planes. It's more like, he's the guy who lives on planes and tries to figure out how to carry a guitar with him. Or he buys guitars everywhere he goes in between hit jobs or whatever. <laughs> he's, he's a hit man on, in, during the day and at night he found a used guitar shop and went and shopped for guitars. I, okay, that's a hit man. I would like to read his chapter. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like that. Uh, don't, don't spread your eggs out. Put your, try to put as much into one as you can. Um, that was also an early piece of comic advice I had. So I, or, and also, um, I showed a music demo to a studio producer one time, played nine songs, sampled nine songs. He said, you have one good idea in each song, um, and that just makes them average. Why don't take, you take all your ideas and make one hell of a song? <laughs> I have used that piece of advice my entire comic book career. And that's, that was a big piece of advice. Um, and you're worried about creating a web shop because you have to pay taxes on merch. Um, you mean merch like this, my Echo Cup? <laughs> uh, it's worth it. Uh, the only reason you have to pay taxes is because you made money. If you want to make money, make merch. And don't complain about the little taxes that you have to pay at the back end of it. You just factor that into it. It's uh, like selling something on eBay. Don't complain about the selling fee. It got it sold. You know, maybe that was the only uh, venue where you would ever find a buyer for your oddball, you know, the old vintage camera, whatever you're putting on eBay. Um, you finally found a buyer in Michigan who's been looking for that camera. And now you got to pay a $40 fee and plus shipping. Good. You're lucky because <laughs> you sold the camera. Right. So I had to pay merch on every on this and everything that's in my warehouse. I have to pay uh, taxes on all that. It's not as bad as you think it is. Uh, that's not the reason not to have merch. The reason not to have merch is because either you have uh, no IP or you have no customers. Um, so if you have an IP and you have people reading your stuff, make the merch and you can start modestly with uh, easy to order things like this online, or uh, it, the most modest thing you can do is just go to your local print shop and make postcards, um, bookmarks, um, stickers, things like that that you can do at a Kinko's or uh, Staples, things like that. Um, yeah, it's you start modestly and let it grow organically. 
Don't go immediately make nine pieces of merchandise. Make one to take to the show or two to take to the show. Um, and one of them can be print that costs you, costs you virtually nothing. You got a stack of prints for, you know, $15 at Kinko's. Um, and you sold them at the show for five, ten dollars each. Um, yeah. yeah, it works. The dynamic works. So trust it. Trust that you will be able to figure out your story. Just you need to only need a general idea of what the ending is, unless it's a really tightly conceived murder mystery. Um, you really only need a general idea where you want your characters to end up. Um, then the waking up and not quite knowing what you're going to write every day is part of the fun of the experience of being a writer. Um, you know that you're going to get your character to meet up with Bilbo Baggins today. And they're going to have lunch underneath a tree. And then Bilbo's going to show them, um, flip the ground upside down and show you Middle Earth in a way that you've never seen before. And uh, you don't know how that's going to work out but you'll figure it out once you get to the keyboard. And you know that the end of the book is um, everybody goes to Ireland and gets drunk. <laughs> that's all you need to know. Um, I hope that helps. Um, that's it. Um, hope you guys have a good week. Hope this helped. If you have any other questions, let me know. Uh, I'm not good with technical stuff. I'll share what I do know about that, what crutches and cheat sheets I have. I'll be happy to share them. Um, I don't have any, you know, great context for you, any shortcuts into how to get to Marvel or DC other than to be fantastically talented, get, develop a following online, and make sure that you're drawing uh, Marvel DC IPs until they can't help but, uh, they can't even possibly ignore you anymore. You're just too damn good and they've got to have you. There, that's how you get, that's how you get that job. Uh, if you're doing your own story and you're writing and drawing it, then it's enjoy the writing part uh, and then draw it because you're dying to see it. That, it's that easy. Uh, getting into self-publishing and uh, how to work online, that's a whole other show. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Thanks. All right. You guys have a good week and I'm sure Robin will be back with us next time. Oh, one last thing. Um, when you're, if you have to, if you wear glasses, and these are your normal glasses, and then they, you realize you want a pair of computer glasses, and you think, eh, I just want something big so that I can see the whole screen, and nobody's going to see me in them anyway. That's a mistake. I forgot that when I got these big computer glasses that this is what I have to wear for all the Zoom calls. <laughs> So all the Zoom calls, all the people that I'm talking to, like in Hollywood and in publishing and promotion and all that, uh, this is these are this is what they think my glasses look like. <laughs> these these big lenses here. So uh, yeah, think about that when you get your computer glasses. In the world of Zoom calls, uh, you might want to make sure that you know pick something a little more normal, <laughs> so you don't look like an old man with uh, you know peepers. All right. Bye.